Hello, International Grandmaster Ron W. Henley here with our continuing online chesslessons.net coverage of the 2012 World Chess Olympiad being played in Istanbul, Turkey. Okay, so of course, this is the match Americans have been waiting for. The U.S. playing the Russian Chess Federation. A powerful, powerful team led on board one by former world champion Vladimir Kramnik, rated almost 2,800. But we have our own superstar, Hikaru Nakamura, playing the white pieces, and he starts out with knight f3. After knight f6, g3, g6, bishop g2, bishop g7, c4, and now Kramnik starts to set up a symmetrical Grunfeld-type structure. Hikaru exchanges on d5 and then plays knight c3. And here Kramnik plays something a little bit interesting and very solid for black. He plays a very early knight to e4. What this does is it opens up for his bishop and it also challenges the white knight on c3. Now, of course, Karpov in his career had many games with castles and he would play knight e5 as white. Black would play e6 to support the pawn on d5 and then after castles, knight at f to d7, Karpov would reinforce the knight on e5 and after knight c6, bishop e3. This was a very big Tobiah type position from Karpov's career. Games with Timon, fantastic game with uh, Gatikomsky and Linares one year is actually in Karpov's best games video. Uh, games with Kasparov. Karpov really knew how to milk this position for white. So, going back, of course, Kramnik and uh, Hikaru both understand this, and so Kramnik plays very early knight e4, which has done very, very well for black. Been very reliable. Now, of course, white could play knight e4, but Hikaru plays queen to b3. The queen on b3, of course, puts pressure on the pawn on d5, and black exchanges on c3. Queen c3 would be unimpressive, as the queen would be on the c-file later, so of course Hikaru plays b takes c3, which bolsters the center, but also creates a backward pawn on the half-open c-file. Castles, and now, interesting idea, knight to d2. By removing the knight, he unleashes again pressure on the pawn on d5. e6 reinforces the pawn, and now e4 trying to chip away at the center, seeing if he can get black to uh, give up a little center here. After knight to c6, castles, and now knight a5. Queen goes back to d1, and here black has done quite okay with b6, simply preparing to bring the bishop to a6, very logical. And three games at all ended in draws, white either played rook e1 or bishop to a3. Again, a very small sample, only three games, not too meaningful, not extremely high rated players. So this is really the highest rated encounter from this position. And here Kramnik introduces a new move, queen c7. The idea is that he immediately puts pressure on the c3 pawn to see what white wants to do about it. Of course, moves like bishop to b2 I consider to be almost illegal, as the bishop doesn't have a great future from there unless you're able to advance the pawn. Uh, Hikaru apparently agreed and he played queen f3, simply providing lateral defense to the little pawn on c3. Black continued with b6, and now bishop a3, a very nice diagonal, the a3 f8 touching the rook. Rook goes to d8, of course, supporting the pawn, and now e5. And we can see, white has the pawn chain from c3 to e5. He also has a beautiful diagonal. Bishop to a6, black likewise has a nice diagonal from a6 to f1, and now rook at f to e1. Note that rook at f to c1 might run into bishop h6, which is a bit unpleasant to say the least, because a move like knight to, d knight to c4. After knight c4, bishop takes, queen takes, bishop takes, and white simply doesn't have enough for the exchange. So after bishop to a6, Hikaru slides his rook over, which incidentally is not bad because it overprotects the strong point pawn that is biting into the black position. But after rook at a to c8, the pressure on c3, complete mobilization of the black forces, and the game is equal. Notice that uh, 
Again, if he puts a rook on d1, bishop h6 could be annoying. So Hikaru plays bishop to b4. Kramnik now activates his fianchetto bishop there with bishop h6, touching up the knight. And Hikaru plays queen back to d1. Of course, rook d to d1 was the other way to defend. But after queen d1, Kramnik now plays knight back to c6. And of course, the idea, given a chance, is he would play knight takes and queen to c3, splicing up a couple of pawns here, touching up the knight. So of course, after knight c6, Hikaru retreats his bishop. And now Kramnik simply goes knight back to a5. Hikaru goes bishop to b4, and Kramnik simply plays knight back. Again, he's renewing the threat to simply take, take, and queen c3, penetration. Also, notice in this situation he would be attacking the knight as well. So after knight a5, bishop to b4, knight c6, bishop, they do the dance, and now this is the critical moment. Not only a critical moment in the match, and possibly in the whole battle for the Olympic gold. Because the U.S. at this point is trailing in match points, and if this match ends in a draw, it is highly unlikely with only a few matches left that the U.S. would have any chance whatsoever of catching the Russian Federation. So now Hikaru makes a tremendously interesting sporting decision. He plays knight back to b1. And we can see that from a theoretical point of view, this is this offers black actually a slight edge. I mean, he has some chance of hurling the h pawn forward and trying to develop some initiative and so forth, but notice that the knight blocks in the rook on a1. If you look at the black forces, they're all perfectly developed, actively mobilized in the center. And so here, I have to say that, you know, to play such a move and take a chance to play all out for the win against a weaker player is one thing, but against a world-class 2800 player, so I think we really have to give Hikaru a lot of credit here for being a team leader as well, because in a match like this, the players feed off of the results of each other. And if Hikaru on board one with the white pieces had just agreed to a short draw, even playing against a former world champion like Kramnik, just think of the kind of message that that would send to the other team members down the line. On the other hand, the fact that he was willing to take on a slightly inferior strategical position in an effort to go all out and take the battle to the Russians it also sent the right kind of message. So the game continued with b5. However, queen d7, h4, rook c6, h5, rook d to c8 would have been one way to build the black position. But b5 is certainly reasonable. And after h4, here I think is where Kramnik kind of starts to lose the thread. He played knight c6. Okay, well, it's clear that he wants to try and play b4 and break up the queen side here. However, what was wrong with the straightforward, obvious, and strong knight to c4? For example, well, bishop c1, and then b4 would be very nice. Pawn takes and queen takes, and you don't need to look too hard to see that this is just total activation for, uh, for the black units. The knight on c4 is dominant, the queen threatens the pawn on b4, the pawn on d4, and the rook is now on the beautifully open file. It's just all systems go for black here. So let's take a look. Knight c4. Let's say the bishop goes to c5. A bit more logical. Well now, the very nice idea, bishop to g7. The threat there, of course, would be simply to play knight e5. And then on bishop a7, knight to d7, trapping the bishop. And of course, we don't need to explain how ugly this position is. So let's go back. Let's say knight c5. Bishop c5, bishop g7, exclamation point, and let's say move like f4, reinforcing the center, certainly is logical. Then, how could we proceed? Knight to b2, very nice touch on the queen, queen c2, and now knight a4, ejecting the bishop out of c5, and then, for example, if bishop to b4, queen to b6, exclamation point. And why shouldn't black be doing well? All of his pieces are totally mobilized. And for example here, the threat would be simply to play queen takes d4. Ouch. So after queen b6, let's say white tries to hold it together with queen f2. Then 
Very nice retreat, bishop to b7, getting ready to hurl the, the a-pawn forward. And after rook c1, a5, bishop a3, b4. And believe me, if you've had this type of position in blitz games against Karpov, you don't need to go much further in your analysis. Anatoly is just superb on the black side of these positions. So let's go back. So I think knight c6 was a bit complacent on uh, Kramnik's part, and I think he just really failed to deliver on his initiative. So after knight c6, bishop to c5, queen to b8, well, it's clear that he wants to play b5, but now Hikaru plays a very nice move, queen e2. This holds black up for a little bit because he pins the b-pawn. So now Kramnik comes back to the idea of pulling his knight into c4. However, maybe bishop f8. Even though this does weaken the dark squares, but on the other hand, it gets rid of this impediment over here that's uh, holding black up on the queen side. And then after bishop takes, rook takes, a4, queen b6, bishop takes, queen f3, and, you know, it's, it's a double-edged game. For example, white might play queen f3, queen e3, knight d2, and then the good thing here is, okay, black has an outside pass pawn, but white's center has been reinforced. It's very easy to defend c3 for a long time. And then from here, the knight can either go to b3 to c5 or to f3 and maybe with queen h6, knight g5 and try and attack on the king side. So after queen e2, Kramnik plays knight a5, and this is probably a bit slow. After knight d2, white is actually starting to build up the position a bit. Very easy to see how white can improve. He can play moves, for example, like knight to b3. Or he can play moves like f4 and h5, and then swing the knight over to the king side. So, at this point, Kramnik is probably regretting that he didn't play his knight into c4 earlier and really try to make something out of the chance he had for the initiative. Instead, though, he sacrifices the exchange, which is also very dynamic. After knight d2, he sacrifices the exchange, very practical decision. And the idea here is that he wants to open up the queen side. After d takes c5, he now plays queen c8. And of course, with queen c8, we see that the uh, white pawn structure has been dramatically weakened. So after queen c8, Hikaru now plays knight f3 and brings the knight over to the king side. But probably a safer way to play would have been knight to b3. Then, for example, there are various ways that black can go wrong. Knight takes, pawn takes, being the first and most obvious because he can't get the pawn back on c5 because the a-file is now open. Uh, after knight to b3, for example, knight to b7 would be another loser. Very strong a4. Okay, and after knight to b3, b4 also is probably not too great because queen c2. And after knight c6, take, take, knight into d3, and then rook d1 would trap the knight. So we can see there's a number of ways that uh, black could have gone wrong after knight to b3. And if he plays the obvious knight to c4, well then simply a4, opens the a-file, and black still has not managed to recover the pawn on c5 yet. So black probably does not have sufficient compensation. Instead, Hikaru played knight to f3, and after queen c5, then played knight to h2. But again, a4 deserved serious consideration. For example, knight c4, and now a little bit of a bizarre move that uh, Fritz helped me to find was queen d1. Not at all a move that would come to mind to the human. But the idea is that after knight to b2, you play queen to d4. And on queen takes, you meld your pawns together. And after knight takes, you simply mobilize with rook at a to b1. And strange enough, but uh, white is doing very, very well here because there's a lot of targets on the a and b file and he's ready to drop his bishop back. His pawns are tight and the bishop on h6 is out of play. So knight to b3 definitely would have been a way to... Uh... So in the game, Hikaru played knight f3, and queen c5, and now knight h2. Kramnik played bishop back. However, queen c3 would have given him full compensation. For example, knight g4, and now bishop d2 this is a very nice move. Rook e to d1. Knight c4, rook over, h5, knight check.
And this is a kind of position where black is doing quite, quite well. White doesn't have a serious attack here, and black is just crashing through on the queen side. But after knight h2, bishop to g7, Hikaru played h5, and now Kramnik played g5, double question mark. As Sarwan would say, this is a real howler. Why in the world didn't he simply take the pawn on c3? For example, knight g4, you can even take the one on h5. Rook over, queen over, knight check, you take it, and then bam, knight into c4. Black stands very A-OK -okay here, full compensation. Or again, take on c3, if the immediate rook c1, queen d4, centralized. Keeping an eye on the pawn, and after rook at c to d1, queen c3, or queen b6, black is doing quite OK here. So after h5, Kramnik uncorked g5. Like, gee whiz, where did he get that from? So of course, Hikaru powered in with h6. And after bishop takes h6, queen h5 with a double hit on the bishop and the pawn. After bishop to g7, queen takes g5. Now he's pinning the bishop and attacking the rook with check. Knight to c6, and then knight to g4. And at this point, white has a winning material advantage. The point being now, it's too late in the day to play queen c3, because rook e to c1, zapping the queen against the knight. When the queen stays on the rook on a1, you simply take and interpose. And we can see, check, and the queen are hanging. So after knight g4, Kramnik had nothing better than bopping back, offering the exchange of queens. Hikaru complied with queen takes, and then a4. Excellent play as he opens up his rook on the a-file. Black now gives it the all-or-nothing try and creates a passed pawn with d4. If knight to c6, simply bishop back, rook over, and rook over, just pincers in on b5. So after a4, Kramnik goes for it with d4. And now Hikaru plays a takes b5, but a less complicated solution was knight to c6, bishop takes, pawn takes, knight to g6, and then simply c takes d4. White is just a solid exchange up with absolutely no technical issues. For example, b4, rook over, and rook over. And the extra exchange will soon tell. In the game after d4, Hikaru played a takes b5, bishop takes b5, and rook a7, which is sufficient to win, but once again, knight to f6 check, bishop takes, pawn takes, and then if knight d5, simply take it, pawn takes, and this is a pretty easy technical job for a player of Hikaru's uh, expertise. So, rook a7, sufficient, but a bit more complicated. Now, Kramnik plays d3, and after rook takes e7, once again, knight f6 check. This was a pretty easy way to take care of business. Simply surround that little baby, baby and it's all over. But in the game, Hikaru played the complicated rook takes e7, and then after d2, this little pass pawn is kind of the equivalent of the Hail Mary pass in American football late in the fourth quarter when you're down by two or three touchdowns. Rook to d1, and then bishop into e2. But knight e3 connects the dots, and now bishop takes e5. So of course white is a full rook ahead, he'll lose back the exchange on d1, but nonetheless he should easily have enough material to win. Black, for his part, meanwhile, is trying to remove all the pawns from the board, so if he gets down to uh, end game, he might have a chance to draw. Hikaru plays c4, simply preserving the very valuable passed pawn, and this guy is looking to motor on up the board. Uh, another plan here, though, was to simply rotate defenders. Play rook d1. If d1, you simply get rid of it, and then play c4. Or, on rook b1, if he takes the pawn on c3, then you blockade with the knight. Always the best blockader. On bishop back, rook c7, bishop d3, rook b3, and white is a rook up, black can play around a bit, but at the end of the day, the pawn on d2 is not enough compensation for the extra white rook. This would have been a pretty easy way to handle the case. But Hikaru played c4, but now Kramnik plays h5. 
Karu plays rook a7. Of course, the idea here is that he wants to play rook a8 and simply get rid of the rooks. So after rook a7, h4, he could now play g takes h4 and fall in with black's idea, and then just simply play rook back, reinforce the blockade, and this should be enough to win pretty easily. In the game, though, Hikaru played rook a2, going after the pawn right away. Now, after bishop takes, black is able to remove the rest of the kingside pawns. And he still hasn't gotten rid of the little devil at d2. But, on the other hand, white has his own passed pawn. And here, black should play king g7, would be the best resistance. Instead, he played, after c5, f5. But now Hikaru plays very nicely. Rook to a7, cuts the black king off, also prepares to escort his pawn across the c7 square. Black plays e5, his only chance in life is to get going, and white plays c6. Of course, with c6, he's now threatening to play c7, rook over, and rook a8, and it's lights out. So after c6, black plays e4 to shut in the white bishop. The bishop relocates to the h3 diagonal. Rook goes to c8, and now rook a6, simply defending the very valuable pass pawn on c6. Rook swings to f8 to defend the pawn on f5, and now very nice move, rook a5. Hikaru plays, actually Kramnik now plays f4. But let's say he played rook c8, trying to uh, get rid of the public enemy on c6. Then the very nice rook check, rook check, take on g3, and when black pins, you simply connect the dots. So rook a5, very nice technical shot, pretty much puts the game on ice. f4, and now king f1. Hikaru, in a game we saw earlier in this tournament, uses his king to blockade the enemy past pawns. A motif he's cognizant of and quite willing to use. However, another interesting solution was rook g5. King h7, and then simple liquidation with rook takes and c7, followed by c8. And then you're going to have to mop up the pawns and mate with bishop and knight. King f1, e3, and now king e2. And we can see the king and knight, as a team, completely blockade the dangerous looking black pass pawns. Rook f6. Note that f3 checks, simply king up, rook check, and now not king d2, bishop e1 check with an ugly change of fortunes, but instead, after rook e8 check, you simply take this guy. And that's pretty much the end of the story. So going back, Kramnik played rook f6, trying to hit this little guy. Hikaru checks, and checks. And then on rook f7, now plays a very nice rook b7. This way, if the rooks get exchanged, his pawn is even further away. King f6, and now king f3. Again, totally using his king to blockade the enemy past pawns. Rook e7, and now here he exchanges, and Kramnik goes for uh, one last swindle with e2. And of course, Hikaru doesn't take that because f3 check, and bishop takes c7, leads to a draw. After e2 check, Hikaru very alertly uses the under promotion rule, c8 equals knight, check. Once the king moves out of check, king takes, and with a two-knight advantage, white has a straightforward technical win. He simply has to eliminate the pawn on d2, force the black king into a corner, and checkmate him up. Let's see how Hikaru handles the task. King e5, knight b6. Notice before collecting the pawn on d2, he coordinates his troops, gets them all tight. King d4, bishop back to g2, and the other point, the light-squared bishops actually help since Hikaru is attacking. Bishop e1, knight d5, threatens the pawn on f4, pawn is defended, and then the knight comes over to b4. Very nice. From knight b4, he'll be able to play knight d3 check. So after knight b4, bishop h4, knight d3 check. Once again, notice how all of Hikaru's pieces are on the light squares. This is a very nicely honed instinct that he has developed and since black has no light square power, Hikaru understands instinctively that if all his pieces are on light squares, 
he absolutely eliminates any possibility whatsoever of having an accident. So after knight d3 check, king f5, king takes d2, and then king back to e2. Again, everybody on the light squares. King f6, knight check, king g3, and then bishop f3. We can now see that the king, the black king, is already boxed into this diagonal here on h4, g3, and so forth, or this uh, little rectangle. Notice that a mistake would be to play knight e4, knight f4 check, and yes, you would win the black pawn, but you'd be left with two knights, which is insufficient mating material. Thus, the game would be a draw. Instead, bishop f3, keeping things under control, keeping the king boxed in. Bishop d8, knight e4 check. Again, we're all on light. King h4, and we can see the black king has no escape. Knight e5, bishop c7, knight g6 check. And now, very nice move, knight to e7. The point being is that this knight now comes to f5, where it covers the h4 g3 squares, while the bishop covers the g4 square, and then that in turn frees up the other knight. Bishop to b6, and now king f1. The enemy king, again, our king, is worth three and a half points, and we can use our king to eliminate more squares from the enemy king. King h2, and now bishop g4. Notice bishop g2 was also good, the idea here being simply to play knight h4, and bam, knight f3 mate. And after bishop g2, this bishop cannot stop the knight from either going here, or d4, and then to f3. But Hikaru played bishop g4, which also forces mate very shortly. And after f3, he now played, very nice, knight h4. So we can see, this bishop covers this square, this knight covers g3, these two squares are off-limits to the black king, and the knight is ready to come and capture on f3. Kramnik, in fact, resigned here. After king h1, simply knight takes f3, bishop c7, and knight f2 mate. Fantastic sporting achievement by Hikaru Nakamura leading the U.S. to a tremendous two and a half, one and a half victory in the World Chess Olympiad. Again, Ron Henley here. Thank you for joining OnlineChessLessons.net.